In this video, we continue our exploration of amino acids and proteins by looking at how individual pairs of amino acids link together to form what are referred to as peptides. And when we form a very long peptide chain that folds up into a specific three-dimensional structure, we refer to that as a protein. So what we will be learning in this video is in essence, how we can take individual amino acids link a bunch of them together to ultimately form a protein product. Taking a look at the general workflow of what we'll be doing here, we're going to be taking individual amino acids where each of the 20 standard amino acids is represented as a different colored circle here in this schematic. By linking those individual amino acids together, one pair at a time, we ultimately form a peptide chain, this chain shown here, of individual amino acids covalently bonded together. Once that chain reaches a long enough length for it to fold up into a elaborate three-dimensional structure, we refer to that as a protein. In an upcoming future video, we'll be looking at some of the specific three-dimensional aspects of protein structures. But for now, what we're going to focus on is this step of the process. How do we go from individual amino acids to the so-called peptide, which represents structures that have linked individual amino acids together. The general reaction that we will look at here is one that we have learned previously. That is the reaction of a carboxylic acid with an amine to form an amide product plus water. Proteins are composed of individual pairs of amino acids that are linked together via amide bonds in other words. These amide bonds in the context of peptides and proteins go by the fancy name peptide linkage. So a peptide linkage is really just an amide functional group. And this is ultimately how the body assembles proteins through reactions that are carried out within the ribosome of. Now it is important to note one key feature, which is that when we are referring to amino acids at physiological condition, we previously talked about how at that pH of seven, that the carboxylic acid group generally isn't present with an OH group here, but instead at a pH of seven, that condition favors, instead of having that OH group there, that proton has been lost to give an anion. In other words, this is at physiological pH, a carboxylate salt. On the other hand, the amine at physiological pH, since the amine is basic, at physiological pH, there is adequate proton available for that nitrogen to pick up an extra proton, and therefore, rather than being present as NH2, instead, it's generally present as NH3 with a positive charge on the nitrogen. This we talked about allowing individual amino acids to be called Zwitter ions because at one end of the amino acid, there is a negatively charged carboxy group. At the other end of the amino acid, there is a positively charged ammonium ion, making that molecule have positive and negative charges within the same molecule and hence being called a Zwitter ion. So be aware when you're working with amino acids and linking those together to form these peptide bonds that you very well may encounter the groups as the protonated form of the carboxylic acid, which has the OH group in place, or you may observe it as the carboxylate, which has the negative charge that we see here. For the amine, you may see the amine show up as NH2 with no formal charge. You may also see it show up as the ammonium cation with a positive charge. In both cases, these molecules will react through this same mode in order to give peptide linkages. Now let's apply that general reaction information we learned to the specific example of forming peptides from individual amino acids. At the top of the screen here, what we see are a couple of different amino acids where we recognize them as amino acids because they have the carboxyl group and they have the amine group present in the same molecule with one carbon separating those two groups. And that particular carbon has the so-called R group, the side chain that comes off of it. And that R group is what distinguishes amino acids from one another. So in other words, there are 20 different R groups representing the 20 common amino acids. So what we have here are two amino acids reacting with one another. We have distinguished between the side chains by referring to one of them as R and the other one as R1. 
These could represent whatever individual amino acids that you want. And what happens is that we take the carboxy group from one of those two amino acids and we link it or react it, in other words, with the amino group of the other amino acid through that reaction that we saw just a moment ago, where when we react a carboxylic acid with an amine, what we do is we ultimately get rid of the OH group from the carboxylic acid, and we replace that with a bond to nitrogen. So we're gonna replace that OH group with a bond to the nitrogen atom of the amino group here. Ultimately, what results from that is by linking the carboxyl group here with the nitrogen from the amine group, we generate this so-called peptide bond or this amid linkage where we have our carbonyl group in red here corresponding to the carboxy group. And then in green, we have the amino group from the other amino acid. So this link, this peptide bond or this amide group is what joins the two amino acids together. At the end of this, we see that the amino acid that we started with on the left here has a free amino group right here. The amino acid that we started with on the right after the reaction has taken place still has a free carboxy group here on the right-hand end of that molecule. And this, and this will be the case regardless of whether you have a dipeptide where you've linked just two amino acids together like we've shown here, or whether you have a peptide of 2000 amino acids linked together. At one end, there will always be an unreacted amino group at the other end, there will always be an unreacted carboxy group. To allow us to orient the molecule, we refer to the unreacted amino end of the molecule as a so-called N-terminus, or nitrogen terminus for short. On the other hand, we refer to the carboxy group that is unreacted at the other end of the molecule as the C-terminus, or carboxy terminus. So we will use this terminology throughout our discussion of both peptides where we've linked a few amino acids together, as well as proteins where we have linked up to thousands of amino acids together. At one end, there will always be an N-terminus. Conventionally, that's listed at the left-hand end of the molecule, no matter how long it is. And at the right-hand end of the chain, we will list the C-terminus. Now let's go ahead and apply the general information that we've looked at over the last few minutes toward a specific problem where we are asked here to draw the structure of the dipeptide that results from linking alanine to phenylalanine, those are the three letter codes for the amino acids, with alanine at the end terminus. In other words, alanine is going to be the amino acid that has the unreacted amino group. In order to solve this problem, we can apply our chart of the 20 standard amino acids, finding alanine. ALA, see the abbreviation here in the three letter code. I'm going to go ahead and circle that for convenience here to help myself in finding that again in a moment. And we're going to be reacting with phenylalanine or PHE, looking for phenylalanine and the amino acid that has a PHE abbreviation, we see it located right here as one of our aromatic amino acids. So what we will do is taking each of these two structures, we're going to link them using that amide bond. I would recommend to tackle this problem that we draw out the structures of each of those reactants so that we can evaluate how they are reacting. Since we have alanine at the end terminus per the directions here, I'm going to draw alanine on the left. I'm going to put the carboxy group, the COH, oriented toward the right there so that it's ready to form a bond to the next amino acid that I'm going to draw further to the right in the structure. I'm reproducing the compound exactly like it is in our amino acid chart here, which you can rely on. And if you don't have access to this chart that I'm showing here, you can certainly do a quick Google search and turn up charts of amino acids. So I'm interested in being able to apply this information toward these types of problems. So this is our alanine structure, ALA. Our R group in this molecule, we can recognize by finding our so-called alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is that carbon that is located between the carboxy group shown here and the amino group shown here. This is referred to as our alpha position. It's alpha relative to the carbonyl group is the way that we look at that. And so the R group that we refer to and that distinguishes the amino acids is what comes off of the alpha 
carbon. And so that would be this methyl group right here. That is our R group for this particular amino acid. Now I'm going to go ahead and put plus here to represent what we are reacting with. And I'm gonna draw what we're reacting with in a different structure. So I'm gonna take phenylalanine. I will go ahead and draw that out. And I'm going to draw that out as we see in the chart with our aromatic ring. Remember that for aromatic rings, we can abbreviate the alternating pattern of single bond and double bond by just putting a circle inside of a hexagon. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm drawing out the rest of the structure here, and I encourage you to follow along in drawing this out or even hit the pause button and try to work through this on your own based on the general information that we've looked at. So drawing out the full structure here, and I think it's important to be able to recognize where the alpha position is in these. It helps orient us within the molecules. So recognize the alpha position here. It's going to be right there where I've highlighted in yellow here because we have our carbonyl group. Always the alpha position is next door to that, and then it's followed by the nitrogen of the amine group. Our R group, therefore, is going to extend off of there. I am going to go ahead and choose another fine color to represent that with. We'll go ahead and use black here. So our R group here is that CH2, which I showed as the bend in the line right here, and then the aromatic ring, our benzene ring there. So going ahead and taking a look at what product would result from this, what we will do is we will link the carboxy group, specifically the carbonyl group there, from our structure on the left, that is our alanine structure. We'll link the carboxy group here of this structure with the nitrogen from the other reactant, from the other amino acid, from the phenylalanine. So we're gonna connect the carbonyl group here to the nitrogen there, getting rid of the hydroxy group along the way so that we don't go over the octet rule at this carbon. And we also have to get rid of one of these two hydrogens here on NH2, because otherwise we'd go over the octet rule. Let's go ahead and draw what results from that. So drawing this out, we are going to color code, or I'm gonna to try to color code here, that we have our methyl group from our alanine. We're going to have an unreacted amine group here, which I will abbreviate or show here as NH2. I'm going to, so we have our NH2 group there. Drawing out our carbonyl group now, and then that carbonyl group is what forms a covalent bond from this carbonyl group. We eliminated that hydroxy group and the carbonyl group by definition of making a peptide bond is gonna come over to the nitrogen to make an amide linkage. And if you ever draw one of these and you don't have a carbonyl directly bonded to the nitrogen, you've done something wrong along the way. You need to take a step back and take a closer look at what's going on. So we've linked the carbonyl group here to the nitrogen that was originally NH2, it becomes NH because in order to not go over the octet rule, if we make a new bond to the carbonyl group, we have to get rid of one of the hydrogens. And then that nitrogen is going to be connected to the rest of this molecule here through this bond that we see here. And so I'll go ahead and draw that out in red to represent the same color that we used on the reactant side. Drawing that out, we come to the alpha position. So I'll go ahead and draw that in and I'm gonna highlight that alpha position in yellow here, like so, because the nitrogen that we had in red here is connected to the alpha position in yellow, so that's right here. That alpha position in yellow is a good map for us because we can take that alpha position and we recognize that it needs to be bonded to the COH and it also needs to be bonded to our R group shown there in black, that is the aromatic portion of the molecule. So taking this and showing our aromatic ring directly bonded here, I could have shown that aromatic ring, by the way, off to the right. That would have been appropriate as well. And then put the carboxy group up here. Either way will work. And then the remaining spot here is going to be our COOH group. So COOH, representing the product of this reaction. Now, taking a look at this to make sure that we have dotted all of our I's and crossed all our T's and that we have everything in order here, I want us to double check that we do indeed have two alpha positions present. So we do indeed, because we have the alpha position here that originated from alanine, where the R group is still intact there as it should always be. So we have a methyl group there. And we recognize that this is the alpha position because it's between a carbonyl group and a nitrogen. Same thing over here between the carbonyl group and the nitrogen. We have our alpha position and that alpha position is connected to the aromatic ring of phenylalanine. The other key point that we need to recognize here is that we do indeed have a peptide bond. That's this amide linkage, 
for we'll have a carbonyl group directly bonded to a nitrogen. Make sure that you have the correct number of hydrogens on here so that, that nitrogen is represented as a nitrogen with three covalent bonds and it would have a lone pair of electrons there. And we're not showing that because this is a line angle formula. So then from there, we can label the N terminus and the C terminus as an exercise here. The N terminus will be shown at the left-hand side of the molecule. And that is represented by the unreacted amine functional group. On the other end of the molecule, we should have an unreacted carboxy group, which we call our C terminus. So anytime we are making a dipeptide or a peptide of any length, be it three amino acids or 3000, we will always see that there's an N terminus at one end that's an unreacted amine group and a C terminus at the other that is an unreacted carboxylic acid group. And do keep in mind that we may also alternatively show these rather than as NH2, they may be shown as NH3 plus and COO minus. Now with the knowledge from this video in mind, you should be ready to take any combination of two or more amino acids, be given the sequence of those, and represent the structure of the peptide product that would result from linking those amino acids in a specific order. You should also be comfortable with labeling the N terminus and the C terminus of those structures that you are able to draw and recognize each and every amide linkage within the structure. Now that we've looked at the structures of peptides, we are going to take a closer look in the next video at the three dimensional aspects of proteins. So in other words, once we link together a long string of amino acids into a polypeptide, what represents the three dimensional shapes of those? Since three dimensional shape ultimately drives the function of these molecules, we need to know about that.